We can lie, we can deceive, we can mislead with our words, but body language can't lie. So when you say something and say, I love what, you're do- what, you, what you wrote, and the smile is kind of fake and forced, and the eyes don't light up, and the cheekbones don't separate like that, and the whole face doesn't light up, that's an indication that, that isn't, that's a false emotion. They're trying to pretend to make you like them, that they really are impressed with what you did. So you can, de- you can determine the real intention of people, whether they really like what you're saying or really like you or really like what you're doing or not. And the smile is the one that people use the most to disguise what they're feeling. Welcome back to Growth Minds for another episode. We've got a very special guest. His name is Robert Green, who is the author of uh, the popular book, The 48 Laws of Power, and his latest book, although it's not completely new, uh, but his latest book is The Laws of Human Nature. Thank you so much for joining us, Robert. Thank you so much for having me, Sean. My pleasure. Yeah, so this is uh, the round two that we we're doing after a couple of years now, and I think you're our first yeah. return guest. So, really excited oh. to be sitting down here with you. Oh, I'm honored. Yeah, yeah, and, and I'm honored as well. I know that the first time we spoke, uh, you and I were kind of talking about this off air. Obviously, we were talking about how the first interview was around 40 Laws of Power, and I think you were just talking about writing a new book. You couldn't talk too much about it, so you were. Uh-huh. You weren't able to share the title of the book, but you told us that it was around humans. Uh, maybe you said human nature. I think you might have just told us the title of the book at that point, but I was like, oh, that sounds kind of mysterious. Um, so I'm really glad we can finally talk about it. Yeah, it came out uh, about two years ago. It certainly is about humans, a subject that I'm very interested in. And basically, I say it's sort of like a compendium of all the things I've learned of all my research and all my writing for the past 20 years. This is a book that kind of combines everything that I've learned in that process and also through my consulting work. And I go very deeply into what I consider the very roots of human behavior because I think that what causes us so much pain and misery in life is our inability to understand the people that we deal with and often our inability to even understand ourselves. And so we, we misread people, we misread their intentions, their desires, whether they're on our side or not on our side. And when we misread them, all kinds of problems ensue that we're not even aware of. And it causes reverberating consequences and turmoil and drama that can cloud our minds and make it very hard to focus on the important stuff. So I wanted to give you guys, readers out there, a really important, like a Bible. This is how you can read human behavior on a much deeper level and really deeply understand those people that you deal with on a day-to-day basis, whether it's your spouse, your colleagues, your boss or whomever, or your clients or whomever. Yeah, yeah. And this is, this is certainly general enough to apply to almost everyone. And I know you provide a ton of histories. And one of my favorite things about the way you write is you do a ton of research. I'm not, I think you read somewhere around 300 books to get the research around writing the laws of human nature, right? That's correct. Yeah. Which is insane. Uh, well, yeah. if you're, if you're going to write a book that has that ambition that I mentioned, you better do your research. I don't want people to say, well, what's this based on? Is it just your own ideas? No. It's based on books by neuroscientists, by anthropologists, by people who've studied human behavior for centuries. And, you know, I'm, I'm compiling all of that incredible knowledge that's now at our fingertips here in the 21st century mm. and sort of putting it all together. So the research is a very important element of all of my books. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a lot of historical stories that you use uh, in, and you provide very specific examples uh, that's extremely interesting. You kind of ca- you're able to capture people's attention and you talk about how the based on history, how that still affects us as humans in modern times. And it, you, you have an interesting approach, which is you have this kind of dark side of looking at how humans are. And but you believe that we can be taught for good in the end. Can you talk a little bit more about that philosophy? 
Well, yeah, so many of the qualities, each chapter is basically on a very elemental part of human nature, and there's sort of a negative spin to them. So, for instance, the first chapter is about irrationality, the second chapter is about narcissism, there's chapters about envy, grandiosity, and these are elements that are kind of wired into our nature, into our animal nature, that go back hundreds of thousands of years to our origins as a species. But they're not really, the things that created us in our prehistory are not really very relevant to the 21st century. So for instance, the fact that we tend, that we're basically emotional animals. We tend to think of ourselves as rational, as intellectual, that we think first, that thinking is the most important element of human nature. But I'm saying no, it's our emotions that govern most of our behavior. And our inability to understand where our emotions come from and why we're feeling a particular way causes us a lot of problems. So I want to turn this around. I want you to become aware of these kind of shadowy, dark elements that lurk in your unconscious, that lurk at other people. And by becoming aware of them, you can turn it around. So for instance, the fact that emotions tend to govern our behavior, and it's something that's been demonstrated in by economists, for instance, who look at our behavior when we purchase products and how they're basically, they call this the affective heuristic, that most of our choices in purchasing things are not best based on rational thinking processes, but on very primal emotions, which is what market, marketing people use to manipulate us very well. And so by becoming aware of your own predisposition to react emotionally to things, you can begin to correct that. You can begin to become more aware. You can begin to see what governs your behavior. And then you can start to become more rational in your choices, in your decisions in life. But only if you become aware of the fact that you are essentially irrational can you begin to turn that around. Only if you become aware that you are essentially self-absorbed and narcissistic, and I make the point, that we like to point our fingers and say, oh, it's the other person who's a narcissist. He or she, she's aggressive. He or she, they're envious, etc." But I'm trying to say, no, we all share the same nature. We all have ten these sort of dark tendencies. And it's only by recognizing this in yourself can you begin to change it, can you begin to turn that ra irrationality into rationality. You can begin to turn that self-absorption that we are all basically have into what I call empathy, which is the opposite. So awareness is the most critical part, the most imp important life skill that you can develop. Being more aware of who you are and what governs your behavior gives you the possibility to perhaps change some of these negative patterns in your life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, when I think about those with, I mean, to take it to an extreme form, you know, when you're talking about alcohol, uh, Alcoholic Anonymous, the first thing that I ask you to do is to admit that you have an issue and to right. be aware around it because the idea is when you can admit that you have something that may be wrong with you, whether you can control whether it's your fault or not, it's something that you can start to at least take action towards a solution. And right. I, I do want to focus on this idea of self-awareness because it seems like it's like this foundational thing that everyone must have in order to really take those things that you the laws that you have in the book and, and apply that to our real life. Um, right. I'm, I'm curious to know, you know, what, what is something that uh, someone can do to gain a greater self of uh, awareness? Is this is there some sort of tactics that have worked based on people you've worked with or people that have read your book? Well, it's a great question. Um, the first thing is, you have to have the desire to want to change. So most people think, no, I am aware. I know who I am. I know that I'm basically a good person. It's other people that are the problem. And until you're willing to say, no, that some of the problems in my life actually stem from me and not from other people. I have patterns. If you can't take that first little tiny step and look at yourself and admit that maybe you might be the source of some of these bad patterns in your life, then my book won't have any effect on you. So you have, to, I've done a lot of consulting 
with people who were very powerful, CEOs, political figures, et cetera. And the number one quality that I distinguished and that determines whether they're, good, they're successful or not successful is, are they willing to listen to advice? Are they willing to take criticism? Are they willing to let me tell them what I think is wrong about what they're doing? And I tell you, most people who are in powerful positions don't have that capacity. And it's what limits them in the end. They don't want to look at themselves. They want to continually point fingers at other people. And that's an extremely, that's like actually law number one, the fact that we always look at other people as being having these qualities. So the first thing is, is basically an act of humility to say, I have these issues and I want to change. I want to be a better person. I want to be more effective. I want to have better strategies. I want to deal with people better. I've made mistakes. And the thing is, people think that I'm this sort of all-powerful person who wrote these books. I wrote The 48 Laws of Power, etc. And in writing the book, The Laws of Human Nature, I had to come to terms with the fact that me, the writer, I have these qualities. I am irrational. I can be very self-absorbed and narcissistic. I can be prone to feeling envy, etc. So with that first step, then the door opens up. And now you can start taking other steps. You can start observing your behavior in action. So for instance, you might want to go through a review process and go look at your past and go look, take like a, a traumatic experience in your work history, or perhaps you were fired or punished and you don't really know why or, or you think somebody else was to blame or, or it's unfair. Go back and analyze that and see if you can think now with some distance, whether there might be a seed in there that you planted in your own behavior, in your own attitude. Not to say that you're completely to blame, but what was the role that you played with your own actions, your own psychology, your own attitude, and analyze that. And then try and notice if there are patterns in your life. Everybody has patterns. That is one of the chapters in the book, Law Number Four, about compulsive behavior. You'll notice that when you make mistakes, like if you make wrong choices in personal relationships, you tend to make the same wrong choices over and over again. So notice certain patterns in the past and begin to understand that that pattern isn't because of the gods, you know, messing with your mind. It's coming from somewhere within. And now with these sort of an analyzing of yourself, you can begin to understand yourself better and see what might have caused these problems in the past. And that's the only way that you can get out of some of these bad patterns. I could go on and on each chapter, have more advice about how to become more self-aware. You can, a very important element is the ability to analyze your own emotions. That's something you can start to do tomorrow. So you notice it's best to start with powerful emotions like anger. Okay, all of us experience anger in this world and frustration, right? And you'll notice when you're feeling it, you'll tend to blame or externalize it. Oh, that person said something, or they did something, or they messed with me, and that's why I'm angry. And I want you to take a step back, and I want you to see, where does your anger really come from? Does it become from what that person said or did? Or might it have started earlier in the day when somebody else different, like your spouse or your children, or someone else said something that got under your skin, and you're carrying that with you, and then somebody crosses your path, and you get angry, but it's not them, it's something prior, or maybe it's something in your past, or maybe it's something in your childhood. So don't just react emotionally, and just assume that your anger, or your depression, or your frustration is real. You have the ability to analyze and see that maybe it's coming from within, and maybe you're the source of it. And with that ability to analyze yourself, it's, it's actually one of the most important life skills that you can develop, the ability to look at yourself with a bit of distance and see and, and analyze why you're feeling a particular way. Those are some of the tips that I would give for beginning this process. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the fascinating things about training yourself and, and opening yourself up to become more self-aware is that no matter how much you think you're aware of your own emotions, and how you react to things, it seems like there's a never-ending quest to continuously to be more self-aware. 
even though you think you are at a certain level, there's always new things that uh, you can continuously discover more about yourself. And you you brought up this idea of aggression, which is uh, you know a very common thing that happens or anger. But you also talk about when you have this idea of being self-aware, you can actually channel it to do something yes. good for yourself. Can you talk a little yes. bit more about that? Yeah, there's that's in every chapter. But um, so, you know, I'm trying to make the case that we all have aggressive energy. It's not that we're violent. Some people are violent. It's just that we have aggressive. We want to push ourselves forward in the world. We want to get things for ourselves. We want to secure our position. We want to secure our own interests. It's an aggressive energy that every human has. It's very natural because we're born in a world that's very insecure, where there's a lot of dangers, and we have to be very careful. And so we're naturally aggressive in trying to assert ourselves. And that aggression can be actually a positive thing. Now, often it's negative if it's played out against people, if you're, if you're pushing people around, if you're manipulating them, if you're violating their space, if you're using them. These are aggressive a- actions that are actually quite negative in the long run, and they're going to turn around and, and harm you in the end. You're not in control of your own aggressive energy. But that energy is actually a positive thing. You don't want to get rid of it. You don't want to become someone that has no energy. So, for instance, ambition is a very important part of being a human being. We all have ambitions. You notice that when you were a child, you had dreams about what you were going to become. And often you either stay with those dreams or they kind of fade away as you get older. But we all have a desire to be recognized, to prove ourselves, to be successful. And you don't want to be ashamed of that ambition. You don't want to be ashamed of that aggressive energy. It is aggressive. You want to use it. You want to channel it. You want to channel it towards becoming better in your profession. So working really hard and improving yourself at whatever you do, you're using that aggressive energy for something very positive. Let's say you're somebody who feels a lot of anger. There's a lot of injustice in this world. And we're all dealing with that right now with a lot of the protests that are going on in the United States. And I know you've had some of that in Canada as well. You know, I know I feel a lot of anger and anger This was sort of the root of the 48 Laws of Power. I was feeling very angry about the world of Hollywood where I had worked prior to writing that book. And you can do two things of anger. You can let it kind of consume you, and you can let it become an obsessive energy, or you can channel it into something productive. There is a lot of injustice in this world. There is a lot of unfairness. There is a lot of causes that deserve our our, our need to be changed. So channeling that aggressive energy into a cause which you're trying to improve the world is another very positive way of turning that around. Um, I talk in the book about envy as a very normal human reaction. It's very human to compare ourselves to others. And I tell, I give you, I, I tell the reader, think in the course of a day, how often are you comparing yourself to other people? Wow he's getting more money than his salary is better than mine. His children, her children are doing better than mine in school. You know, why is that person getting a raise and not me, et cetera. You'll, you'll notice that over half of your thoughts are constantly comparing yourself and particularly in social media that really feeds that we are looking at people's Facebook or Instagram posts. You go, wow, they're having a great time. Why am I not doing so well? And that envy can turn into something very negative and and and, and um, kind of consume you, or there's a way to turn it around. So instead of comparing yourself to people and and acting in a passive aggressive way to harm them, try and see well maybe I need to put that energy into becoming better, into actually through my own actions proving that I'm superior, that I'm greater, as opposed to cutting other people down. Maybe I can compare myself to people who are less well off than I am instead of always comparing myself to people who are doing better and in comparing myself to people who have it worse than me, I can feel some gratitude for where my life is right now. And feeling gratitude is a very positive emotion. So on and on, all of these things can be channeled in a different direction. And the chapter that is the most obvious about that is I talk about a dark side, that all of us have a dark side. It's an energy that we had as children where we were very aggressive and impulsive and always sort of acting out. And then as we get older, we repress it and we try and become a good person, 
nice and always fitting in. But that dark energy that we had early on, it doesn't go away. We kind of push it down and it comes out later in life in ways we can't control. Well, that energy actually is very, can be very interesting. You can use it in very positive, productive ways. You can use it to become competitive. A lot of athletes have that dark side. And I talk about the late Kobe Bryant, um, one of my idols. He had a very powerful dark side, very kind of aggressive energy. And he channeled it into becoming the best basketball player in the world. I can go on and on and on about how you can turn all of these negative qualities around. You know, but that, that gives you an idea of what I'm of my of my uh, approach. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's certainly novel because, as you mentioned, I think we're taught in modern society to suppress and repress ourselves from feeling those or even expressing those out in the public, uh, even internally, just because we've developed this habit of not not exposing that to ourselves. And it seems like it's like a small mental tweak that you're suggesting, which is instead of going on defense, use that as an offensive way to apply that in other parts of your life. Because it seems like, I know you talked about this, but it, it seems like envy is an inevitable thing that we just can't get rid of. It's, it's just embedded right. into our, uh, I guess, our, our, our genetics or the way we think since, since back yeah. in the days. Um, what, why is that, by the way? Why, why is envy like a sin that has been embedded in us? Well, it, you'd have to go a little bit into the neuroscience about this. The human brain is developed as an instrument for comparing information. So when something comes into our brain, whether optically or, or however it is, we have to compare it to other information that we've received to determine whether this is something we need to pay attention to. So the brain is this machine for continually comparing information to what has happened in the past and to what we're perceiving in the present. And so we are very much prone by nature to compare anything that we see in the world around us. But when you also add into that, that we're an incredibly social animal, that our lives, our future, our survival depend on how we get along with other people and that we, we inherited the social animal trait from chimpanzees, from primates, we're mostly social as well. And so if our brains are continually primed for comparing and all of our life and our survival is about dealing with other people, we're gonna use that comparing mechanism to continually focus it on other people. Do they have more than we have? Are we doing as well as, 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 as they are? Do we have as many possessions, as much money, as much power as they have? And then it's very fascinating because they've done studies of chimpanzees, for instance, and there's they've definitely detected traces of envy in chimpanzee and chimp behavior. So if one chimp is given a, a bunch of bananas and the others aren't, the others are looking at him very, very negatively and, and, and feel a lot of kind of envious energy, etc. So this is something deeply wired into our nature. And in very primitive indigenous cultures, they understood that envy was the most dangerous human emotion of all. They were hyper aware of it, which is why you'll notice in the in cultures like that, in hunter-gatherer cultures, for instance, if anyone had like a better piece of meat or it was given a gift, they immediately shared it with others because if they kept it, they knew that they were going to pay a price. That maybe somebody would kill them when they were in their sleep. So you had to, if you gave it, if you got a gift, you had to give it immediately to other people. So it's a quality that is so deeply wired in our nature, and. The oldest piece of literature that we have, basically, at least in the Western world, is the Old Testament. And so many of the stories in the Old Testament revolve around envy, you know, Joseph and his brothers, etc. Even the story of Cain and Abel. And so these things are so ancient and so rooted in us that we're not even aware of it. Nobody it goes around in the world admitting, yes, I'm envious of that other person, because we don't like to admit that, that emotion. We're always justifying and say, well, they're a bad person. That's why I'm feeling this way. So it's an incredibly prevalent emotion. And my, one of the things I try and make is it's very primitive, but with social media, it's now incredibly modern because social media is an instrument for feeding and igniting this natural envy that we all feel. Because now we're not only aware of what our neighbors are doing, we're aware of what the whole world is doing 
of circles that expand well beyond people that we know. And so it's constantly teasing and tricking us into thinking, why don't I have as good things as as other people, etc.? So it might be very primitive, but it's extreme. It's something that we're all dealing with now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's. Um, I, I'm not sure if you've read the book by uh, Charlie Munger. He talks about how envy is is really one of the most uh, useless sins because it's the only one you can never have fun at. You know, with lust. Yeah, exactly. At least, uh, it's it's a little bit useful. You know, so with envy, there's a lot of pain and no fun. It's interesting that you point out that we can actually use that as a tool to get what we want. You mentioned the example of Kobe Bryant as a modern example. Um, I, I'm curious to know, and maybe it's in parallel, but we're, we're certainly envious of the people that are more successful than us. But for those that are in that position, maybe that are at some level of success, there is this level of imposter syndrome that happens. I've certainly felt it before. And so it's this other side of the equation where some people have this opposite effect where they achieve a certain level of success, but they don't feel like they deserved it. And they almost it can be a very negative way to look at the, the world that way. Um, how do you think this relates into this whole equation of, of what we're talking about in terms of envy? Well, um, you know, it, it's, there are ways that that, that that happen. I've talked to a lot of people who, who tell me that, and I say, well, let's look at the actual facts here. Let's not get all carried away by this emotion that we have which is a form of a kind of a form of envy because we're comparing ourselves to others and we're feeling like we're, we don't deserve what we have, right? That I don't really, I don't really deserve the success I have, you know, it seems fake. And so the thing that you need to do in situations like that, believe it or not, I actually had that feeling 20 years ago when my first book was very successful because prior to that, I hadn't been very successful. I had been kind of, you know, a bum. I worked in Hollywood and my parents were beginning to wonder that 36 year old son hasn't really achieved anything. And then suddenly I had the success and I'm going, did I really deserve that? I mean, I, I'm still the same person. It, it doesn't, something feels awkward. So it's often with people who are in the first flush of success and they don't, they're not really sure about themselves. So in that sense, you want to get rid, you want to be able to do what we talked about earlier and analyze that emotion and go back and see, first of all, in any kind of success in life, there's an element of luck. I had luck. It, it's not, and that doesn't mean that you don't deserve what you have, but it's good to recognize the factor of luck so you don't get a big head, which would be the opposite of the imposter syndrome, and think that you have the golden touch. But okay, so recognize that there might have been some element of luck, but there was also something that you did that you deserved it. That, you know, your actions actually led to this success and analyze and try and cut the difference between what is real and what is fake. Because there's so much hype in our culture and so many people are successful and they don't really seem to deserve it. It mostly seems to be about marketing and, you know, and self-promotion. So it's hard to, t- to realize what's real and what's not real. But if you are 30 years old and you started a business and the business is doing really well, um, there's probably a reason for that. It probably is because you spend years in your 20s developing skill. Those skills are real and you've developed experience and you have some creative energy and you put it into this task. And yes, other people have helped you and yes, there's an element of luck. But give yourself a pat on the back and realize that probably a lot of it stems from actions that you've done and that you're not really an imposter, you know? So it's more about analyzing why you're feeling that way. And I know I felt that way because it, the success seemed too sudden. And so that might be the root for a lot of people, you know? And I know, for instance, it's weird because I've done this in consulting. I've noticed a lot more women tend to have that feeling than men do. I mean, it, men definitely have it. But women who are now suddenly, who are, thank God, finally having as much power as we are and being successful in all different businesses and affairs, they've not been socialized and brought up to feel like they are equals, even though they are completely are equals. They've been socialized to think that 
something is wrong with themselves. They don't deserve their success. So I notice a lot of women tend to have that. And I go through a process of saying, well, it's not really coming from you. It's coming from the culture. And that's another element for, that goes into the imposter syndrome. So those would be sort of the things that I would go through in my yeah. analysis of it. Definitely. Yeah. Particularly, um, you know, minority women, right? For people that are you know, talking about Black Lives Matter, this is definitely um, a revolving evolution that's happening uh, as we kind of reach this equal ground. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting because I know you talk about this idea of, uh, well, yeah, it's, it's certainly that everyone does. It does seem like everything is easy when you see social media and stuff. I know this is part of the thing you talk about in the 40 Laws of Power, which is, you know, when you do succeed, make it look easy. And it's, it's, I'm sure a lot of people have applied that, it seems, everywhere in social media. Um, it, is a, it is a difficult thing to go over. And I think on the other side of that is narcissism that you talk about. Um, so it's, you know, it, it, I guess it's really about balancing this idea of self-love that you have without trying to go too far into the world of narcissism, right? Is there any tips that you have for how people can balance that? Well, it goes back to what we talked about earlier. Um, the first thing you have to do is realize that you are self-absorbed, that you have narcissistic tendencies. I try and take the taint away from it as if it's some sort of ugly stain that's on you and try and make you realize that there's something in our nature that makes us self-absorbed. And I explain how that originates in our childhood. And I go into depth about that so that we're naturally, as we get older, we're naturally focused inward and focused on ourselves and our interests because it's a tough competitive world out there and particularly with social media and the smartphone in our hand we become even more self-absorbed and paying even less attention to other people so step number one is to get down on your hands and knees and say yes i sean yes i'm me robert i am a narcissist i am self-absorbed most of the time in my day-to-day -day affairs, I'm thinking about myself. I'm thinking about what I want to say instead of listening to the other person at the table across from me. I'm thinking about what I want to say, what my opinions are, or what, I'm, what happened to me during the day. And you, it's natural. You don't need to feel guilty or ashamed about it. It's how we all are, right? So if you refuse to take that step, if you refuse to acknowledge that you are self-absorbed, then I can't, there's no help right there okay right. that's not to say that there aren't people who are toxic narcissists and i make the distinction there are levels so up here would be empathy 100 percent. you pay deep attention to other people you're completely participating in their thoughts and their words down here is kind of where most of us are where we're a lot of the times we're really thinking about ourselves and down here are the toxic narcissists who are always thinking about themselves, who cannot get out of their own shell, who's so, who are so fragile and insecure that they can't, everything revolves around them. And for those types of people, it's very difficult. They'll, they're gonna need some kind of therapy. But for us, more in that middle ground, becoming aware of it, and then sort of just start take little steps and realize that the, what you want to do is you wanna develop your own empathy. And I explain what empathy is and I explain that is a social animal, as we are, we are gifted with this natural empathy, this ability to enter the thoughts and moods of other people and try and understand their point of view. Babies have incredible ability to figure out, to fathom the moods and thoughts of their mother because their survival depends on it. It's wired into our system to be able to enter into the minds of other people on a very deep level. It's just that you're not developing this muscle. So starting tomorrow, you're going you're gonna to take little baby steps, as, I, as I'm always promoting. So in a conversation with your spouse or a colleague at work who you talk about with every day, try to s catch yourself not listening to them and try and just take a step back and go, all right, for 10 minutes, I'm not going to be too ambitious. For 10 minutes, I'm going to shut that damn little voice in my head and I'm going to really listen to them. I'm going to pay deep attention to what they're saying, to their gestures, to their body language, which is another element in the book that I talk a lot about. And you're going to try and glean one piece of information about them that you never realized before. 
you're going to see something, this person that you deal with every day, by paying deep attention, by really listening, by really focusing on them, you're going to try and find something about them that you never realized before. And in doing that, you'll see the power in this. You'll see that you've been walking around as if you're blind and bumping into things and not paying attention. But when you do, suddenly you understand people's motivations. You understand what they really love, what makes them excited, what their dislikes and dislikes are, what they think about you, for instance, how they react to what you say. Suddenly now you get to see the power in that. And if you glimpse the power in paying attention to other people on a deep level, then you're now motivated to continue this, right? But we don't do these things unless we feel motivated, unless we feel excited. So if you're just told to listen better, it won't mean anything. It'll go in one ear and out the other. But if you feel the sense that your survival in the social world, in your work world, in your family, in your relationship, depends on this empathic quality, now you're motivated to get out of your little hole that you live in and try and really, really focus on other people. And I give other exercises for developing this empathy, which is, to me, the most critical uh, social skill that we can develop. Now, what are some of the things that we should be looking for in particularly, I want to focus on nonverbal behaviors yeah. when we're talking to someone? Well, um, you have to understand that people have estimated <clears throat> that 95% of communication between humans occurs non-verbally. And that means that you are registering other people's information that they give off non-verbally. It's registering to you unconsciously and sometimes consciously. They have a look on their face. They have a posture that seems a little bit negative towards you, etc. You're noticing it. But sometimes you're not noticing it. But you're not paying deep attention. You're not registering it. You're not trusting that information. You pay too much attention to words. When you meet someone for the first time, you're mesmerized by their talk, by what they're saying, and you're not really paying focused attention on that nonverbal aspect, which is where most of, our, of, of humans communicate. You see, when, when we talk with words, we're able to say anything. Oh, Sean, I love your podcast. Oh, yes, you look wonderful today. Oh, yes, I love your book. But we don't necessarily mean it. I'm not being personal, and I'm just using it as an example. Of course. We don't necessarily mean it, right? We can lie. We can deceive. We can mislead with our words. But body language can't lie. So when you say something, you say, I love what, you're do what, you, what you wrote, and the smile is kind of fake and forced, and the eyes don't light up, and the cheekbones don't separate like that, and the whole face doesn't light up, that's an indication that that isn't that's a false emotion they're trying to pretend to make you like them that they really are impressed with what you did so you can de you can determine the real intention of people whether they really like what you're saying or really like you or really like what you're doing or not and the smile is the one that people use the most to disguise what they're feeling and that smile tends to be kind of tight like this mm. got a lot of tension in it Whereas if you're really excited by someone, the whole cheekbones rise up, the eyes widen and move to the side, et cetera. And so, you know, I wrote a book called The Art of Seduction. And knowing that kind of information makes you realize the other person actually likes me. They're following under my spell. They're interested in what I'm saying. Another indication of that same thing is if people mirror you, if you move your arm like this and then they do that same thing, gestured unconsciously that means that they're letting their defenses down and they're interested in you another thing is you know it's like a language i compare it to a language like french or spanish or any language you need to learn the vocabulary so if you walk up to someone and at a party or a social gathering or even at work and their feet are facing away from you to the side when you walk up that means that they're actually not that interested in talking to you. That they're actually their body is 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 mo is directed in another direction. That that's really where they want to go. They're not excited to see you. So pay attention to people's posture, whether they're facing you, whether they're looking you in the eye. Another thing is, you can these are tests that you can do. You can go up to someone, 
and surprise them from an angle and um, see their reaction to you. And in that first second, they can't disguise the fact that they're happy to see you or that mm-hmm. they're not happy to see you. They may suddenly post a fake smile. Oh, it's great to see you, Sean. Oh, wonderful. But before they put that little mask on, there was a, look, a funny look on their face. You don't register it, but if you pay attention, it shows that they're really not excited to see you, right? Oh. So there's all this incredible language that reveals how people really truly feel because you can't fake these things, you know? And then I talk about signs that reveal confidence in people, which is hard to fake, um, and which shows a leader who is basically insecure and the kind of behavior that they go in that reveals that they're not secure, that their ego is rather fragile, on and on. The language is incredible, and mastering this language will give you incredible social power. Yeah, that's fascinating. To go back on the point where you're you're approaching someone from a different angle, are you saying that this, this is something where they don't see you coming, so you can see their actual reaction when they first see you? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Because because if they see these, oh, Sean's coming, they've got like now five seconds to put, put that fake smile on their face and to pretend to be excited. But if you suddenly come like that, and oh, oh, you know, so like if you're, you know, with your friend, like take your best friend, for instance, if they suddenly, someone you really like, they came, they did that to you, you would have a very happy reaction. You're so happy to see them. It just lights up your face, right? You can't disguise that. But the opposite is true. If somebody does that, that you don't really want to see, it'll show up on your face before you have a chance to control it. You know, mm. this is just on and on and on. There are other things like that, but. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wonder though, if that will still apply. How would that work if you, let's say, I mean, this is a common issue, right? With like a, let's say you're approaching a girl and you come at her surprise, there might be the survival instinct in her that, okay, she was kind of instantly surprised because, you know, her instinct is survival. Um, so I guess you have to filter some of those, right? Are you still saying that says a lot about the way she thinks about you? Yes, it's true that maybe um, she'll register a little bit of fear. That's true. But if she is excited to see you, I still believe no matter the the conditioning that a, w- a woman or anybody has about a stranger approaching them, it'll still show up on her face. Imagine that a woman that you're interested in does that to you. You're not, you're going to, sh- it's going to register on your face, right? You might be surprised for a second. You know, you don't want to like frighten people. <laughs> yeah. No, no. It's going to be, going to be a little bit. <laughs> ah. <laughs> right. So, you know, but, um, I think that the emotion will be there. And it's not just the face. I've been talking about the face, but pay attention to the tone of voice because the mm-hmm. voice is something that is also very difficult to fake. Actors are the only ones that can do that. And it takes a lot of training because our voice betrays our excitement. The pitch tends to go up. We tend to talk faster when we're excited, when we're happy. Other things happen when we're nervous you know, our, our kind of stutter and, and et cetera. So pay attention very quickly to, to, to the tone and voice that they have and also to their posture. You know, what, another thing I talk about in nonverbal communication are kind of mixed signals. So this isn't the surprise ones, it's just in general. So the person that you ha- go up to, their face is, they have a smile on their face, but their tone of voice it's kind of tense, right? And so it's the negative quality that they're trying to disguise, but they can't disguise. It's easy to pay, post a fake smile. It's not easy to really show excitement in the voice. Mm-hmm. So they're saying, oh, Sean, it's great to see you. But the voice reveals that they're really not that excited to see you. And the same thing goes for body posture. There's an open posture. There's an excited posture. The body is open. And there's a kind of a cramped negative posture, like, oh, get away from me. Oh, I don't want to see you. Right. You know, you can make mistakes in, de- in deciphering people's behavior, and you have to be careful. And I talk about that. They call that Othello's error. So Othello in the play thought that his wife, he accuses her of being unfaithful, and she reacts all fearful 
and he assumes that means she is unfaithful. But in fact, she was just being intimidated, and so he misread it. So you can make mistakes. You have to be careful, and you have to think and analyze it and make sure that you're not sort of interpreting it in the wrong way. But there's a whole incredible language that you're not paying attention to and that is extremely eloquent, eloquent, whether it's in the realm of seduction, whether it's in the office and dealing with your boss or your colleagues. Yeah, absolutely. The, the thing that used to, uh, the, use, the thing that used to be a little bit hard for me as I was doing it uh, when I was a little bit younger is that you have a lot of thoughts in your head, as you mentioned. So you tend to think about what other people are thinking about you in the conversation instead of thinking about what their reaction is or how their tone of voice is. And as soon as I started to get out of myself, and it certainly helps with interviews, it's all about over-preparation and really knowing yeah. what you're talking about and, right. and not really BSing. But in conversations, you know, a lot of that confidence and being out of you, getting out of yourself, which is self-awareness, really helps you train and not make those mistakes. You, as you mentioned, you can certainly misread people, especially those that are really good at acting. So you talk about acting and how we're all actually actors in our lives and the fact that we should train ourselves to become better actors in some ways. Talk to us a little bit about the, the logic behind that. Well, um, you know, it, we're very natural actors as a social animal. We're continually performing. And you notice that behavior in children. Children are very good at putting on a particular mask to please their parents and to get what they want. If a child wants a toy or wants candy, they certainly know how to put that angelic face on and to charm their parents. So if children at the age of four or five are becoming great actors, you better believe that it's something extremely embedded in our nature. And so as a social animal whose survival depends on getting along with people, we learn to wear a mask. We learn to play a certain part. And so, you know, you'll notice that somebody who is a lawyer will tend to have a certain kind of demeanor and, and body language, etc. Whereas someone who's a rock musician will have a much different demeanor. And you don't want to see that demeanor of the rock musician on your lawyer who's now defending you, you don't want to see a rock musician who kind of behaves like a lawyer because that's kind of off-putting. So we're used to people playing roles. This is what a president should look like. This is what an airplane pilot, this is the aura and the mask they should be wearing. This is what, so we're continually performing. And when people aren't performing, when they do their role badly, if we go into a shop and the salesperson there is like not pretending to be interested in us and is acting kind of like a rebellious teenager. It doesn't fit the role and we're kind of put off by it. So understand that in your life you are a performer. That And, and the other indication of this is, so in the course of a day, you deal with five different types of people. You deal with colleagues, you deal with people who are below you on the hierarchy, you deal with bosses, you deal with your spouse, your family, etc. And for each person, you wear a different mask. You don't talk to your boss in the same manner that you talk to a colleague or your children or your wife. You suddenly put on a different face. You talk in a different manner. So you're constantly altering how you behave, your voice, your manner, your words. You tailor it to who you're dealing with. And most of us do this unconsciously. And the problem is some of us are bad actors. We're so self-absorbed, we're so involved in our own thoughts that we don't realize that people are continually judging us. When you're out in the social world, people are judging you. They're trying to see who, they're trying to see if you fit the role, if you are who you say you are, etc. And they're looking at you, they're scrutinizing you. And if you're not paying attention, you're gonna say things, you're gonna do things that are inappropriate, and they're gonna be offended, they're gonna warn, wonder about you. And these little kind of sins that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, eventually they'll add up in the work world. People will go, hmm, maybe Sean isn't what he says he is. Maybe he's not quite up to this job, etc. Maybe he doesn't have the confidence to pull it off. So be aware that people are observing you and that you need to perform. You need to play the role that's appropriate. And don't be ashamed about this. And don't be embarrassed about it. I think it's 
negative or guilty or something's wrong. This is who we are. We're social animals. We're performers. And why do we venerate actors so much? We uh, admire them because they are the best actors of all. They know how to play 40 different roles, and we think that that's fantastic. If you're able to do that in real life, if you can move from one social setting to another to another and play different parts and fit into the group that you're talking to, that's a consummate social skill, and there's no need to feel guilty about it. So I'm trying to tell you, become a better actor and have sort of ideas about how to do that that I talk about in the book. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, I think a lot of people listening or watching this right now, may, may, the, my, their immediate thought might be by playing an actor in our lives, it may seem like it may seem like we're encouraging people to be fake. Is that is that a different realm you're saying? Well, you're not doing that when you go home and you're with your spouse and when you're with your children. Although even with your children, you play the role of the father. Mm. right you you have to be the father figure and they have to see that you're the father figure and they have to see that there's some authority there and same with the mother etc so you even there you're playing a role okay but you can let down your mask you can be yourself but when you're in the work world you have to realize that you can't just be whoever you are and the and the proof of it is and i'm telling you people who say what you say and i'm not faulting you you're being hypocritical because in point of fact, in truth, you act differently to your boss anyway. You're not all chummy with him or her. You're not, you know, having the same kind of carefree, easy manner that you have with a colleague. Nobody violates that. You're all aware that with the boss, you have to be different. So get away from that hypocrisy and act like you're being authentic. Do you ever really tell your boss exactly what you think about his or her idea? Do you ever really tell them what you really think about the job that they're doing? Rarely, because you know you'll pay a price. And yet you don't think of that, you think of that, you think that you're lying? No, you're just playing the role that you need to do. You're, you're just surviving, you're trying to protect yourself. Mm. So in certain moments, it's good to be authentic. At certain moments with your friends, after you leave work, or if you have a, if you're a performer in, in, in the public realm, if you're a, a rock musician or an artist, letting some of your natural energy and being authentic will actually play very well. But if you're in a social environment where people are judging you and looking at you and seeing what kind of role you're playing and how well you're doing and they're looking at you and seeing if you fit in, you better be careful because not fitting in and being judged negatively is going to cost you in the long run. So I want to get rid of the guilt that people feel about that. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, and I'm thinking about this not as a parent, but as just in my own life, where it comes to talking with my mom is completely different than I would talk to my brother or my friends, all of whom I'm completely comfortable with, all of them who I know there's a mutual love there. And even as probably as a parent is probably more than ever, because as a as having a kid, you have to censor yourself. You're not going to swear around sure. them. You're not going to see the content right. that you're going to watch. It's actually such a core thing. And your kid is really the thing that you love the most in this world. Um, yeah. It really makes me rethink this idea of what authenticity mean and what this common quote that everyone lives by, which is be yourself and, you know, you know, love yourself and be your, like what it kind of makes me rethink this whole idea of what that means. It seems like we have multiple identities actually that we have to use as a tool based on what situations we're on. Yeah. And you know, I don't want to um, downplay the importance of being authentic. So even as a parent, your children have to feel like that you're not always fake, that it's not just to put on that you genuinely love them. So it's like, the problem human beings have is they can only think in either or situations. They can only think it's black or white. I'm either being inauthentic or I'm being authentic. Well, it isn't like that. Life is more nuanced. So with your children, you're playing a, a, a role where sometimes you play the father figure, the authority figure. You change your behavior. You don't smoke marijuana in front of them. I'm just kidding. You know, whatever it is, um, et cetera. You tailor what you say. But then you're also being natural with them when you're playing with them. You're also at the same time able to show who you are and be yourself 
and be your natural energy. You can do both things at the same time. It's not impossible. And we do it all of the time, right? We're constantly doing that. It's just that you're not aware of that fact. So even at work, people can see your, who you are in your natural energy and see some of that authentic self that you are. They can't see completely because you might offend people if you're completely yourself. So you're able to let out some of it depending on where you work. Some offices are different. So in my consulting work, I once went to Microsoft. I did a talk at Microsoft. And everyone there was really buttoned down and nervous and repressed. Mm -hmm. And in that work environment, you can't really be yourself. And then I gave a talk at Google up in Mountain View. That's the all totally opposite. <laughs> they're all like children. They're all like playing. They're all like loose, etc. There you have more room to kind of let it out and be yourself. Not completely, but more room. So don't think in terms of black or white, authentic or inauthentic. You can combine both at the same time. If you're completely fake, if you're always, you know, wearing a mask, it doesn't play well either. People will think that you are a, a phony. So you have to be able, a good actor, I, I did some acting before I wrote books, mm. a good actor is able to actually play a role and be authentic in it. They learn to generate the emotion that they're trying to feel. So if they're playing a role that's where they're crying and sad, they first generate that, they think about experiences in their life where they had something sad happen, and then they, they feel the emotion. So they know the importance of actually bringing some authenticity to the role that they're playing. Mm -hmm. So it's a mix, it's a, it's a kind of a dance that you're doing between the two. Agreed, agreed, yeah. Um, as a last topic, that uh, as we close this off, Robert, I wanna talk about uh, you know, I think in between our last conversation and today, I know you you suffered something that was pretty tragic, which was a, a near death experience uh, of having a, a stroke. And I know you talk about this publicly as well, and how this relates to to your new book. So you're, you've got 18 laws in the laws of human nature, and the last law is about death and the, the denial of death. Um, talk to us a little bit about how this real life event that's happened to you relates to this closing of the book. Yeah, it was very weird. It was almost like the gods were looking down or, the, or God was trying to play a game with me because <clears throat> the last chapter of the book, as you mentioned, is about death and confronting your mortality, which I wrote in, I think I finished it in about May of 2018. The book came out in October of that year. And so it, that I wrote a, 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 all my sort of thoughts about confronting your mortality and how being in denial of it it's actually holding you back. It's actually riddling you with fears. And then three months later, a little less than three months later, I had a stroke <clears throat> and I came this close to dying. Um, I was driving a car. My wife, my girlfriend then was next to me. And she said, pull over, pull over. Something's wrong. No, no, everything's fine. She noticed that my whole face was funny and everything was wrong. She was very worried. She had me pull over the next, I'm, un, I'm unconscious and I'm in a coma for several hours and I had a stroke. And um, so if she hadn't noticed that right away and if the ambulance hadn't come quickly and took me to the hospital that was close, I wouldn't be talking to you here right now, Sean. Wow. I would have had either, I would have either suffered permanent brain damage, which I came very close to having, which would have meant I couldn't even talk or I would be dead. And, or if I'd been alone, and driving, I would be dead for sure. So I came very close to dying, and I can. Rem it was very vivid experience. You know, I'm unconscious for a while. And strange things are kind of going on, although you are unconscious, and then you awake, awaken, and you don't know what happened, and then it suddenly you sort of pieced together, and I sort of felt in that in those few moments, I felt death kind of invading my body before I passed out. I can remember it after I woke up, a feeling that I still sometimes have. It's physical, like I, it's hard to explain, but it was something that I f feel in my bones, kind of a strange softness as if things from the inside were melting. And so the irony is three months before that, I was writing an intellectual abstract thing about confronting your mortality. And then suddenly it became something very, very real. And I was, it was there, you know. And so it's one thing to talk about it and analyze it 
That's another thing to experience it. You know, it's very visceral, it's very real. And it's been a, a very powerful experience. Not all very positive because the stroke, I'm someone who is very physically active. I like to swim and hike. And that was just ripped away from me. Suddenly overnight, I can't do any of that. You know, I'm getting better very slowly. But the frustration and the actual envy that I have. So I'm sitting here in my office in Los Angeles. It's spring. And I'm seeing people bicycling up the hill and running and hiking. God damn it. I wish two years ago I could do all of that. Why? Why did that have to happen to me? Mm. I'm so envious. I had to deal with that. I had to deal with those emotions. And I'm learning and I'm getting better at it. I'm developing patience. I'm kind of meditating more. And I'm trying to work on myself. Uh, but the other thing is, I have an, I'm not afraid of dying anymore. I already experienced it. it the fear is gone. And it's sort of like a, a nice feeling to know that you don't have this, this incredible fear that you carry around with you. It's not that I want to die. I'm very much happy that I'm alive. And I'm also very grateful. So sometimes, like yesterday, I was thinking, what if I had been swimming when this happened, which I'm often doing? Mm. I wouldn't be here. I would have drowned. And now I wouldn't be having this conversation. I would be dead. People would be talking about me. My book would be out there, but I would be gone, you know? And so when you think like that, it kind of makes you appreciate that you are alive, that I am here talking to Sean Kim, that I am able to, I still have my brain here. I'm, still, I'm going to be able to write another book. So confronting death, as I wrote in that chapter, is a good thing. It makes you not so afraid of anything in life. And it also makes you appreciate the things that you constantly took for granted. The view out of my window, the sound of birds in the air, you know, everything and things that sound a little bit cliched and Pollyannish, but they're true. Yeah, I'm alive. I can appreciate them. So, you know, what I wrote about in that chapter is very real. I'm not saying that it, it's not relevant. It's just it's a thousand times more real when you go through it. Yeah, it's it's an ironic uh, process. Very. It's an ironic process that we have, uh, especially since it's one of the things that most of us, probably everyone, fear the most, especially when we're nearing death. And it's insane how little prepared we are for facing it, whether it's for ourselves or for others. It's just not something that anyone's going to teach you necessarily unless it's something that you train yourself to think about, which is something that you're encouraging other people to do. How has it affected the way you see yourself uh, in career-wise? Do you feel like you're more ambitious and you're willing to take more risk because you've seen what's on the other side? Well, you know, um, I'm not so young anymore. I just turned 61 a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> Happy so, uh, birthday. Uh, Huh? Happy belated no, thank birthday. You. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, I, I can't be, I know one thing is my next book is dealing a little bit with this experience mm. of, of facing death. I have a whole philosophy around it that I'm building up in my next book. And I'm very motivated to get this book out and to write it because I know that any day now I could die. I could get the coronavirus tomorrow. I'm a high risk for that because I had the stroke. I could, you know, be hit in my car tomorrow. I could have another stroke. I better get that book out before I die. So it's gotten me more focused on that. And I am working very hard, but I have to be careful because if I work too hard, I, part of the reason I had the stroke was I worked too hard. And I took too much stress on. So I have to be a little bit careful. So it's kind of made me much more focused to get this next book out before I'm dead because I want it to be out there. It's a very important book to me. But some people, it tends to think, well, you know, now that I face this, it doesn't matter anymore. I don't even need to, to get anything more done, you know. It doesn't have that effect on me because I love my work and I love getting a book out there. But I know that I'm not getting younger and I just have to be more careful with my energy and not let this happen again. So it hasn't 
curtailed my desire or my ambition. It just made me a little more careful and not pushing myself too hard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, just given everything with Corona and all the news that we're hearing, I think people around the world are thinking more about death. And I think you know, hopefully the lesson here is that you can you can die doing what you love, but it would be worse if you died without doing what you didn't yeah, very love. Much, very much so, very much so. Yeah, I mean, I make that point in my prior book, Mastery. I talk about uh, Leonardo da Vinci, sort of the icon of that book. And he had a quote, he was on his deathbed, basically saying, just like at the end of a day when you've worked really hard, you have kind of a blessed sleep. If you've worked hard your whole life and got things done that you wanted to do, you have a blessed death. It's like going to sleep after a hard day's work. Ah, I'm ready to give up my life because I've accomplished things. I've done what I wanted to do. So that's it. for if you're younger, it's a wake up call. And I make that point in that chapter. You tend to think I've got this incredible vista of time ahead of me. I've got 40, 50, 60, 70 years. I can waste some time here and there. Yeah, it's okay to waste some time, but you probably don't have as much time as you think. And you could die tomorrow very easily. So knowing that, knowing that you you could be taken away from you in five or 10 or 20 years. Do you want to die not having done any of those things that you dreamed of doing, not experiencing those things that you want to experience, not accomplishing those, those things that you set out that you dreamed of when you were younger? You didn't write that book. You didn't start that business. You didn't make that film. You didn't start that podcast, etc. That's the worst feeling in the world to be facing death in your 40s, 50s, 60s, and to realize I didn't do anything that I wanted to do, and now it's too late. I don't want you to have that feeling. So, you know, confronting your mortality is not a morbid thing. It doesn't mean thinking only about death. It's not like a goth kind of thing. It's more about developing a sense of urgency that each day could be your last day, and you better appreciate it. You better work as hard as you can and get things done and appreciate the time that you do have and appreciate the people that you're around. You know, so some of the people that I'm around, like my wife now or other people, you know, I might I might not have been here for them. So I appreciate them a hundred times more. And the same thing in reverse. Think of the people in your life and imagine that tomorrow they could be they could be taken from you. Wouldn't that alter how you view them right now? Wouldn't you be a little more interested in them and appreciate them on a higher level instead of taking them for granted. So the awareness of death, which is so much repressed in our modern culture, because we don't see anybody dying around us. You know, it all occurs in hospitals where we're hidden from our view, as opposed to 100, 200 years ago, where people were dying all around us in the house, etc. It's very important because we, we can go through life without ever thinking about it, without ever confronting it. But in fact, it is a terribly negative thing to repress that confrontation because it's the most real thing that we have to face. And facing it has all of these incredible benefits for your own personal well-being and for your relationships with other people and for your work as well. Well, one thing I can say is I can't wait until your book around spirituality comes around and we have to have you back okay. to promote this book. Oh, I, I, um, I, I, my pleasure. Hopefully I'm still around. I know I you will be. be. I know you will be. Well, um, this is this has be been more. amazing, Robert. Thank you so much okay. for for making the time. We're going to link up uh, all the books, not just the laws of uh, human nature, but all the books uh, that you have written to make sure that people grab this. Just as a last question, where can people find you online apart from the books that we'll be linking out? Um, well, I have an old website where, where I kind of have everything. You find everything together. It's called Power seduction and war.com those are my first three books yeah power seduction and the word and spelled out war.com and there you'll find links to my other three books as well mastery the 50th law the book i did with 50 cent and the laws of human nature and also links to my instagram my twitter my facebook and a email address if you want to write to me you know your criticisms or your praise or whatever it is so that, that's the best website. Yeah. 
I, I, I love that you have to always point out the fact that you wrote books around power seduction and war. Because otherwise, it's kind of like, what? <laughs> it's a little bit of a weird title for a website. It sounds, Gets sounds my attention, kind of grandiose. So, uh, well, thank you so much, Robert. Thank you guys all for listening. Tune in for next week. See you guys next time.